Well, how I got started in all of this is I met Marge Hancock, and this is Marge Hancock's uniform here in the case. And Marge, uh, I said to her, oh, you were a Marine in World War II. Right. And she said to me, yes. I said, well, what did you do? I assumed that they were all typewriter soldiers. Right. That was a, a, you know, a common assumption sense. back yeah, in the absolutely. 80s because no one knew what women did. And she says, no. She says, I repaired combat damaged aircraft right. at Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point. And she says, I put the radar pods on and I put the missiles on the planes and then they took them out and sent them back to combat. That's amazing. And I was floored because I just really didn't know what women had done and that's what started me on my 40 year journey to research what women, the history of women in the military right. and there's just so much that we've done and you know being in the Coast Guard, Absolutely. you know how much we've done and it, nobody ever talks about it. No, nope. nobody even really really recognizes me usually as a veteran because of because I, of well, I, lo I love kind of when that happens. So they'll, they'll come up to my husband and thank him for his service Absolutely. and I'll say that's my that's my license plate on there. I'm the retired right. Navy person, right. but he's a Marine. So yeah. Women's history goes all the way back to the Revolution. Uh, one of the more famous one is Deborah Sampson. She's in there, and uh, Deborah dressed and fought as a man and uh, was discovered when she was wounded, and she was, uh, uh, you know, uh, let out because of that, but she did put in for a pension and she did receive a pension oh, good. from the oh. government. Actually, she was dead. Her husband received the pension from oh, the government. Yeah. Right. And then uh, in the Civil War, we had quite a few women that fought. My favorite is Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman uh, is called the Moses of her people. She worked on the Underground Railroad, if you know your history. Absolutely. And because she worked on the Underground Railroad leading people out, she became a scout for the Union Army because she knew all the roads and all, you know, all, all the, the back, back trails and everything. Right, right. All the female volunteers that were nurses in the Civil War too. The women just uh, came through uh, uh, the Sanitary Commission. The women in the North organi organized a group to fund the nurses and battlefield medicine and they uh, developed a riverboat to evacuate the wounded. Right. It's what was called the Red Rover. That's in hospital my slide. Boats? Is that the beginning of hospital boats? Yes, it was. Okay. That was the first hospital oh, ship, the Red Rover. We had a lot of women that dressed up as men and fought in the Civil War. Right. And besides that, we also had spies. Women were very good spies because they could use their feminine charms. The Secretary of the Navy found a loophole in the Naval Reserve Act that said you could, you could uh, enlist naval uh, persons for naval service. Oh. So he says, well, a person, it doesn't say man or woman, so we'll enlist the women. So they had about, a, I don't remember the exact number, about 11,000 women served. In World War I, the yeoman F, they did, they did a lot. It was mostly, they were mostly the yeoman, which is typewriters, secretarial. secretarial. Yeah, they pretty much run, ran Washington, D.C., the Navy Department, um, Navy Personnel Department. It was all women at that point in time. But we also had the Army. The Hello Girls, are that's their, their uh, nickname, the Hello Girls. And they were part of the Army Signal Corps. And they were picked because they spoke uh, multiple languages, especially English and French. And they went. They, they were promised commissions. They they dressed in uniform. They went on troop ships, which was the worst part of the journey because they could have been sunk by some German submarine. Uh, I mean, they had their gas masks and their helmets on the back of their chairs. They were under bombardment. They were close to the front and uh, they were never received their military status. When the war was over, the army just forgot about them and just went on to other things. So in the 70s under Jimmy Carter, they received their veteran status, which was well deserved. They, between that and the nurses overseas, uh, we really were full tilt into the war. Woodrow Wilson, in the beginning of the war, was against women getting the vote. By the end of the war, by 1920, when, when it was passed, uh, he turned around. There were 100,000 women in the, in the uh, served in the operational theaters. 
which meant they were in the China, Burma, India, they were in the South Pacific, they were in the European, they were in that. Everywhere the men were, the women served. The women's uniform here, that's of uh, Dorothy Janik, and she was in the Air Corps. She's got great Air Corps patches on her shirt. And this is, this badge here is the ruptured duck. Ruptured duck. That was the civilian or the army slang word for the ruptured duck. Actually, that's a discharge pin. I mean, women were everywhere, and uh, especially the nurses in the mass units. And it's the nurses on the front lines. They would pack up and move as the army moved. So they were, you know, packing up constantly. And yeah. it, um, we had an invasion in Italy in World War II at Anzio Beach in Italy. And when the wave moved ashore, the general hesitated and they didn't move in enough. So they were stuck on the shoreline with their hospitals, were stuck there, and they would have shelling all the time. They called it the Anzio Express because the shells would go over the hospital and try to hit the ships or the beach or whatever. And uh, women, women were killed in that. So we've had women killed in action in all the wars. The women did everything. In the army, they uh, repaired the, the, the vehicles and tested them. The new vehicles at Daytona, that was a, a military base there. They ran motor pools. Uh, I talked to quite a few of the women that were uh, mechanics right. and truck drivers yeah. and, uh, they, and, and, of course, uh, cars for the VIPs and that. And, uh, Charity Adams was the commanding officer of the 6888 or 888, 6888 Postal Battalion. And she wrote her memoirs. And uh, it's called One Woman's Army. That's in, my, in the display there. And uh, it's just an excellent, because her battalion of WACs, Women Army Corps, mm -hmm. were all African American. Really? And they are the only a battalion of African-American women that went overseas. They went to England and then they went to France and they handled all of the mail for all of the European theater. So every single soldier and sailor that was over there and Marine that was over there, they handled their mail. Really? In the book it says how many thousands of pieces of mail they handled a day. That's amazing. And you know, think about it because in Europe they were moving constantly. Right. And Grace Hopper started as a naval officer in World War II. She was a wave and she worked with the first computers. And she became, she, she worked on the co cobalt uh, coating, right. and she, she did it. She made the cobalt, co which allowed computers to talk to each other. Right. She developed it. Yes, really? she developed it. And back in those days, the computers were used for naval gunfire to calibrate naval gunfire. That's what the first ones were developed for. But anyway, uh, so they kept, since it was Navy, they kept a log book. You know, in the sea services, we keep log books for everything. Everything, yeah. everything you do, you keep a log book. Absolutely. And the computer broke down. And she went in and she found a moth in it. Oh, no. So she took the moth and put it into the <laughs> Navy log with a piece of scotch tape, and she says the first computer bug. Oh, no way. And, and she, she coined that bird. term, computer bug. It literally was a bug. And I had an opportunity to meet her. She was about this tall. She, she smoked unfiltered camel oh, cigarettes. Yeah. She, she was quite a woman, oh, let me tell you. And when I met her, I said, I'm so honored to meet you, Admiral. And she says, you should be. <laughs> uh, in World War II, we had women pilots, which was very unusual. They took them uh, from civilian world. They had to have an aviation background. They had to already have time in the air in that. And some of them were even multi-engine pilots at the time. And they drew from all over the United States. And 39 died on active du on duty and received veteran status. They didn't get that till 1977. They tried to incorporate them at the end of the war, I think it was in 45, into the uh, uh, army that would soon become the Air Force, and uh, it failed, it failed. So that set women back for, for about 20 years. If they had been incorporated, there would have been more women pilots, I think, earlier. But uh, they did a fantastic job. And the 39 women that died had no veterans benefits. So when the first one died in an air crash, 
her buddies, her, her comrades at the base had to chip in to have her body sent back to her parents. The back there is my, my memento from my Cold Warrior experience. Uh, being with Naval Intelligence, we, I knew more about the Russian Navy than I did about the United States Navy. Right. Right. And I have a piece of the Berlin Wall there that I got on one of my tours of duty in Germany. Oh. And uh, it actually tells where is it, where it is from, right. too. That's amazing. What section of the wall it's from. I forgot Desert Storm. The rosary down here is an interesting uh, artifact. One of my good friends was uh, in the Air Force Reserve. And she, she was a grandmother, and she got called up really? to go to Desert Storm. Okay. And she was in, stationed in Saudi Arabia. They would not let them bring crosses or anything like that with them. Okay, so through the mail, someone made her a rosary out of twine, made the little beads, no and, and put a plastic cr crucifix on it and send it to her. So that's been to Desert Storm and back. Little aspect, okay, as an as a American history teacher too, I would say that the military is at least 20 years ahead of society. Now it's probably the gap has decreased a bit recently, yeah, time goes on, yeah. but in World War I, the women received equal pay. Right. You're talking, you know, you're talking 1917, women got equal pay, equal rank with the men. They right. were only enlisted, they were not officers, but still. Right. I mean, a lot of them came out as first class. Absolutely. First class, which is, you know, that's tough to do. I was only a second class right. before I became an officer, so first class, I have great respect for that. Not only that, the military progressed women equality and the fact that okay they're taking these men and they're enrolling or they're they're enlisting them and they're sending them to war but that left a lot of industry with no one to work so the women now had to take over those jobs right they had to they had to fill in where the men were missing so inadvertently the military has a huge part in That's breaking a, good a point. lot of those glass ceilings it brought those women in to do the jobs that you know what were not there to do that happened in the civil war in yep. world war one and world war two in the civil war women started to become government service right. secretaries it was all men up yes. till that point and women had to come in because there were no men to do that right. job so because that opened that up yeah and that's the civil war so that opened that up for women Absolutely. although after the war it kind of drifted back and we had to do it all over again but still and now women in the space force i think that is the most promising organization because they're starting out now when women have already received equality in the military and are able to do all the jobs. I hope that with your um, with your exhibit and you know all of those exhibits that that honor women in the military you know being in the Coast Guard I'm a small we're a small branch and I feel I always have to justify you know the Coast Guard has been in every war that we've ever had and I've always feel as a female veteran I have to do the same thing so I hope that one day that people, you won't have to justify that. You won't have to almost stand your ground about your military service and and my choice of branch of service. You know, I hear all the time, oh, the Coast Guard's not a branch, you know. And, and to me, that's just ignorance. And I feel the same way about women in the military. Oh, women don't belong in the military. That's ignorance. That's, that's, um, that's not being educated. And I, I love exhibits that bring that to light and educate people and I hope that that education takes away those prejudices and and, and not only that uh, having a young daughter I, I hope that opens her eyes to sky's the limit she wants to join the Air Force uh, that's all I've ever heard from her and even though uh, I'm Coast Guard I'm very proud of her choice and I love that she wants to do that and these types of things are fantastic for girls that to let them know they can do anything they want to do um, but the sky is the limit and they don't have the restrictions that these women had and these women had and this woman had someday those 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 ignorances and those 
barriers in people's brain and the way they think about veterans will go away. And this, this helps. These, type, these types of history lessons and information helps with that. So thank you for this. This is a great exhibit. Yeah, it was my, very, it's absolutely my pleasure to do so this. So pleased to see it. I'm so pleased to hear your stories and I can't wait to hear more. So. Your Chief Petty Officer and Cryptologist, Shannon Kent, who was a beautiful, wonderful person was a wife and a mother of two and she was in cryptology so she was working with CIA uh, assets over in the Middle East and uh, during one of their meetings they uh, set off a bomb and she was killed and uh, that was only uh, a year after she was in my class and she she was going to move forward and she was going to help military women in psychology. She was a psychologist. And uh, Shannon Kent, they named a Navy facility after her, and they're talking about naming a ship after her, and she deserves it.